absolutely delighted to have Gail on here. Just uh, we, we were going to organise, Gail was coming over to Ireland this week and we were going to organise maybe for something in Belfast and invite people to it. But then we just looked at the diary and went, wait a minute, we're all going to be at the Sheriff Centre. Now, how Guy actually got here is probably another story, but the fact that he got from Dublin to listen to Ski and then to the Sheriff Centre, I think is pretty amazing. Uh, I think you might have a story about that. Uh, we're, we're absolutely <laughs> delighted to have you on, Gay, and um, you know, hopefully we'll have a bit of, you know, you're obviously going to do your workshop, but we'll have some fun and music and uh, later on with maybe a beer or two, I think. Um, but I, I, I'll just leave you to, to take it from here um, on your, really on your book, The Courage sure, of Love. Over to you. Thank you very much. Wow. Uh, I, I feel I'm with friends. Tonight. I mean, I, I've given this lecture a few times already to different people, but it's like I'm with my family tonight. Even if I just got here, uh, you guys are amazing uh, from my heart. So, um, I want to heal the world. That's it. That's my only purpose in life. Uh, when I was young, uh, somehow at one point I decided I cannot spend one microsecond on negativity. I, I just can't. Uh, I didn't know why I was saying that. Uh, I had no reason. But that has been my, 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 my North Star. And the clowning experience that, of which I'm going to share about is going to be maybe give you some ideas of where, how I got to where I am today. Um, and, and we can continue to talk forever till midnight, one o'clock. And when I'm back in Montreal, we can continue the talk. This is not me doing a show. I'm here for you. That's all. And then whatever you want to discuss, we'll discuss. So, um, The Courage to Love, to say it very, very basically, it's my book that came out in April. It's my biography, my memoir from zero, or you know, my ancestors to uh, recently. And it's my healing journey, healing journey from abuse. Okay, and, and uh, we'll talk a bit about that. So, uh, let's see. There you go. Everybody said, ah. <laughs> Look at this. It didn't change much of that. So, uh, all my family is on the farm. Uh, we're cow, we're dairy farmers. Uh, my father became a, a doctor and moved to the city. My two brothers and sister were born in Saint Hyacinthe in, in, uh, on the farm. Uh, I was the only one born in Montreal, so I was I had was neither a farm boy nor a city dweller, and uh, this was a typical New Year's Eve uh, extravaganza where all the cousin and uncle would get together, and ah, I mean so nice, young, happy, and yeah, and then. A few years later, when recently I was looking through my pictures and I saw this and I say, where did my smile go? Where did my light go in, in, in who I was? And it's just kind of, from that on, uh, the, the bullying at school just kind of didn't stop. And uh, my brothers also were kind of very uh, uh, violent. And um, I just didn't know how to communicate. I just didn't know how to reach out to people. Uh, so at school, I'd end up playing by myself alone in a corner. Um, and during lunchtime, I would hide in the library. And in the library, they also had some records. So I was just there reading my, my comic book. And suddenly I, I, had, I felt this stare on my back. And I turned around and I saw this guy, mm -hmm. Felix Leclerc. And it felt like it was the first time in my life somebody was smiling at me. So I took the record with me. I hid it like a treasure. Mm -hmm. I walked home very carefully put it on the record player, and I listened. And one of the songs was called My Little Happiness, Le Petit Bonheur. And as he was singing, it was about a man who, who found on the street one day happiness, 
He was happy with it and then happiness left and he was alone. And since happiness left, when he now walks on the street, as soon as he meets people on the other side, he changes side because he can't meet other people. And when I, I heard that song, it's like, this is my life. This is how I live. I live to avoid people. So music was my first discovery of feelings. I had no feelings before. I was kind of living in a void, in a blackness. And music was the first voice I ever found. And then writing. I started journaling. <coughs> and this is like 40 years of journal. And in journal, I found, I could say, not so much a voice, but somebody who would be listening to me, but I would never show my journal to anyone. I would didn't know what happened in my journals. They were just kind of a way to something happened. They were, all of this were my, how could I say, my instinct. A call that I needed something to happen in my life. And then I became an artist. I went to art school. In, in the first class, the teacher, painting class, the teacher said, well, I don't know who you are. You're all new students. So why don't you make a, a work about yourself? You know, art is about expressing who you are. Well, nobody ever cared about what I felt. I didn't know any feelings. I could listen to music, but that was about it. So then I painted, I took the brush and painted three black lines. And that was it. That was my, what I was living. A few months later, we had a printmaking class. And this is a woodcut. And on the woodcut, it's, it's a pathway. And here, I think you can figure out, it's in French, Défense d'affiché, which means in English, no posting. Mm -hmm. And then the fence suddenly became a kind of prison. And all of this was done I had no purpose. It just came out of myself and I had no way of looking at it either. This is just what was happening. The beauty is when I discovered clay. Now, does some of you do clay? Some of you do clay. In clay, you don't think. It's all about the experience. It's, it's, it's something delicious. It can be cold. It can be warm, it can be hard, it can be soft. So I started to make, you know, a classical Greek sculpture, a bust, nothing special. But as I played with this, the, the clay to explore, this is one of my models for this guy here. And as I was, you know, it starts to dry. And as it dries, then you, you know, clay is very sensitive. You cannot do what you want with it. You must follow what it does. And as I was folding it, suddenly it just kind of cracked. And as you see, I still kept it because it was like it was screaming out to me of a meaning. And then from that, it became this series of sculpture. So this is in a, what they call a special cement. It's a very thin cement. It's about, this would be about, uh, well, this, this tall, so twice about the size. And how I felt about this is that, okay, you are, the person is in the middle position. You could either go towards one side, which is disintegrating, like really falling apart, or going toward the other side, which is kind of standing up, and almost feeling proud. Sculpture-wise, the more it got on this side, the more defined, and the more here it got raw and kind of all uh, carved in. So basically, it was the beginning of saying, well, I'm not doing the art for myself, I'm doing to, where do you see yourself in this culture? Do you see yourself at this stage or which stage, you know? And then I called this sculpture victory. Because 
it felt like something wanted to come out, and it did come out. It came out this way. But the more I looked at it, in the years later, when you work with your unconscious, when you just trust your feelings, you don't know what you're doing, and sometimes you find meaning 5, 10, 15 years later. So, eventually I noticed they have no arms. They have no face. So they have no mouth to express, they have no ears to, uh, uh, well, to hear what is happening, no eyes to witness. So they're totally mute. And they're, they're, they're manly, but still they have no sex. You know, so still, even without arms and legs, ears, mouth, there's still the hope of victory. That something is driving. So, but some days you might feel you're going one day, one direction, or the other, the other day, another direction. And then I won a, a contract to make a statue in a park. So this is you, you kind of three meters style. And this time I saw that, okay, my, my, my man, now he has arms. Okay, he has arms. And now his leg is like squarely one in front of the other. So there is a movement. He's, you know, he's, he has a complete little head, still no features, you know, but there. And then later in years, like, there's still this idea of, of hope, you know. And I call him the warrior. Because unknowingly, I was going through life <laughs> as a warrior. I had no choice. I had, like, my inside. I was able to go forward. I don't know what kept me going forward. But somehow, I was able to do that. And then I went to Europe in before I finished my studies. And then I wanted to do a master's. So I went in Europe and for three months I traveled. And then I beca became in love with portraiture, portraits. It's like, wow, Rembrandt and Van, Van Gogh and all the Dutch Flemish school. And I came back to Montreal and I started to make people to make portraits. So while everyone at school was making abstract art collage <coughs> stuff, already I was kind of going against the grain because suddenly I was doing classical type portraiture. Now, this is uh, six feet by nine feet. So uh, two meters by three meters uh, wide, tall. It's an oil paint. And what, what do you see? <coughs> Even if it's hard to see, what's happening there? What can you make out? Is it a man attacking someone? Yeah. There's a man attacking someone. Thank you. What else? Somebody observing. Somebody observing. A busy street. And a, and a busy street. It's a lightsaber. There's a kind of a symbolic something yeah. there. <coughs> there a torch as well. Isn't there? Torch. It's, you know, it's, but you see there's a violence, yeah. you know, it's become a, a symbol. In, in those days, I was hurt by, you know, what was happening with Nelson Mandela and in South Africa. And actually there was a live aid with uh, Bob Geldof. Um, I hated society, basically. I, I just... Uh, didn't see where I could belong and that. So this just came out. Yes, there is a kind of a violence rape scene. If you see it with, without the light, it's kind of suggests that a kind of naked person is about to plunge the knife. And then this person just walked in. So I just, just like. And meanwhile, and this is like a back alley, but here there's a marquee, a little movie show, and a full crowd. So how come the crowd didn't hear or not? And it was one way for me to say, well, you know, violence has become commercialized. Violence has become entertainment to that point. And then 
in my art, like I say, it, what matters is not what you think of my work and stuff like that, but it's what how you see yourself in the work. You, you, you don't want to see yourself as the aggressor. You don't want to see yourself as the victim. Mm -hmm. So who is left for you to identify? It's kind of very hard. And this is basically me in the sense that, well, what can I do about all this violence? What, you know, I don't want it, but in a way, it's, I'm almost like my statues. I do have arms and legs. I, I see, but I don't do anything. You know? So this, this work was about asking the public a question. You know? how, do, how do you see it? And then I went to Amsterdam. So I was finally accepted, and I started my master's in, in fine arts there. And my work changed so much while I was there. There was so much freedom for me. I started to explore the city. I loved the city. Uh, I went to the jazz bar. I, I drew the, the molens, the windmills. Uh, I was driving my teachers crazy because I was, I was working so hard. And then one day I found, and, and this in Europe, you know about this, it's a little puppet theater. But it was in the garbage, and that made me feel quite sad, because for me it was like a magical object, just thrown away. So I just slowly looked at it, and I picked it up, and then my, my heart kind of broke, because I saw that the sides were made from a baby scrib. So I said, there's so much love in this piece. You know, a father who would take a, an old lady script and just kind of make it into a theater. So I saw it as a beautiful, magical <coughs> object. And then I said, what about all the stories that were told during the years? And for me, they were still hidden inside. There was something magical about it. So I used it as an installation. And it was in an old army barracks. So for soldiers and stuff. And the way it's put, it was like, you know, a scared child that's hidden in the corner <clears throat> and that is being pursued. Like these are strong tungsten light. Those who do photography, they're like totally blinding light. So they were not meant there to, oh, it's my artwork, let's show the light. No, no, there's too many of them. It's them there, it's like almost like the light of awareness. But this is what I know now today. Though in those days, I just thought, no, this needs a, there's an aggression. I don't know why. And then inside it, I hid a, a recording I did of street organ music. So in Amsterdam, maybe they have in other places, maybe in Germany, where if this guy uh, on the street corner and he's turning this big wheel, and there's street organ music. And then he's, yes, it's, it is, um, cup, tin cup, and go asking for money at the same time. So when you walk into the room, so everything else was black, um, there was a gravel, old stones, so it's like it's, you know, it's kind of making noise. And then you see it from far away, and as you get closer, you start to hear. It's very gentle the sound of the street organ music. And for me, I think, as I speak to you now, it's like this idea of hope always seemed to be there, so that maybe the children's memories are gone or they're lost, but they're not. You just have to really come close, and the magic is still there. Um, but for this, I don't know if you guys have ever been in that situation, uh, that was too much for my teachers. And then they came to me, and then they say, Oh, Guy, that's my name. Uh, we know you work hard. You produce so much work, and you, you're so dynamic. But we don't understand what you're doing. So you must be confused. OK. Uh, so that was a big chat, you know, me. You know, it's like, and then I did a show. I said, no, no, I'm not confused. I did the whole exhibition of all my artworks, and then only one teacher came, 
and then they kicked me out of the school. Luckily, I don't know if this helps to happen to you, uh, there was competition between the departments. So I was kicked out of the traditional way, but there were, I was really uh, hired in, in the graphic department, which was the kind of the, the, the garbage bin, uh, garbage of, of the school for all, anything that was new media. Was put, oh, let's put that into graphics. Anyway, so luckily I was able to stay in Amsterdam. Now, after two and a half years of living in Amsterdam, uh, I, you know, I didn't talk about my, my sexuality or my relationship, which were just basically awful all the time, never really could last. And then one day, there was a fellow student that just took a light to came to me. And we had this beautiful weekend together, Secret Lovers weekend in my studio. And the weekend ended with her saying, well, you know, uh, I have to go home now because my husband is coming back from the week away. <laughs> Next year, <laughs> London. <laughs> but I felt so worthless all my life to that point that for me, I took it like, wow, she's married and she still wants to be with me. I must be worth something after all. Yeah, that's, wow. So we didn't see each other for a week and I was just, oh, this is so wonderful. This is so great. And then we met at the coffee shop and we sat together. And for the first time, sitting with someone, I felt like feelings coming up. Because I felt, you know, I could trust her, right? You know, somebody was there for me. So I started to cry, just like that, just kind of little tears. And I just told her, you know, I, I, I feel so lonely. So I didn't even know that myself. To which she replied, well, we can't see each other anymore. Uh, so for me, at that point, it felt like a whole ton of brick fell on me. A whole ton of brick like with sharp edges and like I was bleeding and I was dying at the same time as the Berlin Wall was coming down. But in Berlin, there was fireworks because it was the freedom. But in Amsterdam, I was dying. So the, the only thing I could do was go to my studio and drink, and just drink, drink. And then I thought, if I had a gun, I would kill myself. Because that was the only way to handle such pain. It went on for months. <laughs> <clears throat> Until I was, you know, my friends at school kind of said, well, we never see you anymore. And they were having a party. Why don't you come over? So I went, but I was sitting there and all the conversation were like ping pong in my head. You know, just, I'm just there smoking and, and drinking. And then I just <coughs> turned to my neighbor and I just told her, you know, if I had a gun, I didn't speak up. It's just my, and the guy looked at me and said, but he, you're happy all the time. You're smiling all the time. Tell me more. So I did, and all the friends there listened to me. I didn't know that that existed. I didn't know you could have friends. I never experienced that. And weeks after weeks, I started slowly to get together because of my friends. For the first time, I had friends I could speak to. I had my journal. My journal was my savior, but he couldn't offer me support. But they offered me support. And from then, suddenly, my life started to open up. I got my first little 
half a room studio because I was living in hiding before. You know, I'm worthless. I'm not going to spend money on myself. So I was always hiding in my studio while I was living in Amsterdam. So for the first in my, time in my life, I had actually a small room. I had a telephone. I don't even know if I had a telephone. I had running water anyway mm -hmm. and electricity. That was amazing. I had an exhibition in Amsterdam. Wow, finally my, my work. And I found, you could say, a girlfriend who was just getting out of a very bad relationship. So we were just both healing each other's wounds. We didn't want a relationship. We just, we were good for each other. Let's, let's just put it this way. So my life was going good. It was going so good that one of my friends offered me to go to a yoga lesson. You know, he, he always asked me, let's, let's go to yoga, because he's a teacher. He, he would twist his body like in sailor's knot. I just, I just couldn't figure how he could do that. It was amazing. So after an hour, we did the meditation, the relaxation. You know, I felt so good. My body relaxed. I had a home. I had a girlfriend. I had an art show. My life was perfect. So then the memory came up. And this kind of image appeared in my head. I was like two, three years old, I had putty arms, and I was fighting up a big face. I was fighting, fighting, and then I, I heard a slap, I felt a slap, I heard screaming, and then I felt I had destroyed the world. My whole life just destroyed. That was it. And then I woke up from that and said, what's this? Is this a memory? Where does this come from? So I started to read on, on, on memories, on psychology and stuff like that. And it sounded like, yeah, that was a real memory of abuse. I didn't know that. What's abuse? I have no idea. So luckily, and I know it's strange to say luckily, when my studies in Amsterdam were finished, I went back to Canada, and I went and sat with my mother. And I just kind of said, oh, you know, mom, I have this, this memory of uh, this experience in yoga. And, you know, and did something happen in my youth? She said, why? Well, you know, it's this memory happened. He said, oh, well, yeah, sure. When you were three years old, you had a 16-year-old niece taking care of children. And I just caught her masturbating you. And I slapped her and put you in your room. You were crying. And, well, she was gone. Yeah. For her, it was like, oh, yeah, that year we bought a fridge. And that's it. So it's like, oh, OK, thank you. Uh, but it's like. Is it really that innocent? Does it really doesn't matter? So I went to the bookstore and I look at the book and I picked one up and I started reading. All the pages, you know, thoughts of suicide, uh, bad sexuality, bad relationship, uh, everything was my life. And I became enraged. It's like as much as I was enraged, I was happy. Because then, you know, I read so many people that had lived through abuse never had that chance of having it be confirmed. They, they doubt. Because there's so much denial in the families and stuff. But I knew it did happen. And knowing that it did happen, I had the key to open the door towards healing. That's the way I saw it. That's the way I started. I felt lucky. So I started reading. And then I had started to do an art installation on families and relationships. Uh, it was all about souvenirs and stuff. And then the third show, when I saw how much abuse was important, I did the first show on abuse. And the last show, which was in my own city, I did a show on incest. That's, that's who I am. I'm crazy enough to just go at it and say it out loud. 
And this is part of the installation I did. So I use real furniture, and there was this baby script. I poured alcohol, wine, and aftershave, because smell is very important for the memory and stuff like that. I won't go into more detail. It's all in the internet, so we can talk about it later. But I, that's who I am. It's just, you know, I'm the warrior. I have no idea why I kept on li living. I have no idea why I made victory. I have no idea why only a few years after I was able to make the first artwork about this. So I kept on reading, reading on it. And then life continued. And as we were talking, you need to earn money. So from making art, I started to be a teacher. And I work in museums. And I love working <coughs> in museums. I love working with the kids. I love working with special needs group, the, the, the mothers, uh, young mothers, the, the people in the street. Somehow I just felt I understood them. Somehow I just felt like, yeah, I'm, I'm there for them. And it all went wonderful for a good 20 years until I got a new boss. Have some of you ever got a new boss? Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that was a good experience. My new boss, he wanted, his job was to fire half the staff. And those who stayed was to cut their salaries in half. That was, that's why he was hired for. He wasn't hired to be a nice guy. Well, he, he was very nice. You know, he came to me and he said, Oh, Key, there wasn't the candy there, but it said, Oh, Key, you look so tired. You know, you can't walk so much before you're getting old. Uh, I'm going to give you a nice office job. And then in me, it's like, no, I'm going to die. If I don't work with people, you know, I never talk about it until I came to that situation. And I said, no, I can't. I can't have an office job. I have nothing against it. It's just not me. I work people. I love, I didn't know I love people then, but I just, that was who I am. So I really, really struggled. What do I do? What do I do? And then my father passed away. My father, the doctor, my father who lived his passion his whole life. And then I say, what am I doing wasting my life here? There's no point. You know? So I made a promise to my father. I said, you lived your dream. I'm going to try. I'm going to not even try. You know, I'm going to leave the museum. Me, who was the good boy. I don't know if some of you know the good boy or the good girl. You know, or the yes man, or the yes girl, the guy who never asks anything, doesn't desire anything, doesn't want anything, doesn't say anything, doesn't speak up anything. That was me. I was Mr. Invisible. You know? Later I thought that you know, if you're invisible, there's no way somebody's going to attack you because they don't see you. No wonder as a child, the chameleon was my favorite toy, the one that kind of disappears in the wall. So I left my work to become a speaker. I was already doing talks about art, about music. I love music, I love art. I had all this plan. Yes, I've got these talks written. But then the good boy came back. How dare you think of yourself? How dare you leave your job? You need money. You're bad. I couldn't sleep. He was driving me insane. The doctors were telling me, take some uh, anti-psychotic, I don't know, anti-pills and stuff. I refused. I said, no, no, I'm not going down that road. So, I, I was white as a sheet, couldn't sleep. And then from inside, maybe from the warriors, something came out, I don't know. I, I said, I'm shy, I always want to be hidden. But I heard of, of people getting together to laugh. 
I mean, that's crazy. People getting together to laugh. I mean, okay. It's called laughter yoga. And I went. I went to a first laughter yoga. And after the first half hour, I was in sweat. We were rolling. If you've seen Monty Python, yeah. it's basically la live action laughter yoga. Where they do it's you just it's crazy. And after half an hour laying there in sweat, I say, This is it. That's what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to earn a living with laughter. That's just amazing. So within a you know, when your mind is set to something, so within a few weeks, I found a class and became a certified laughter yoga teacher. A few weeks later, it was my birthday. And uh, the Alzheimer's Society asked me, could you do a class for us? And I did. And it was like seniors, and, and they loved it. I mean, wow. So I saw the healing power of laughter. And I said, OK, I'm going to make talks on that. I'm going to do research. And I'm going to write a book on the power of laughter. So I, before that, I finally took a class clown. Six weeks, no, <laughs> six days clown class, because I saw how humor was important, and I said, how can I add more humor in my talks? So I took a clown clown class, but I was a failure. I was so bad, and, and, and uh, our teacher was like, a, I don't know if that's true, but the Oman, uh, Oman style teaching, which is, Stop what you're doing! Stop walking behind the camera! I see you! What do you think you are doing? <laughs> that was her teaching. That was her way. Like the old school, I see some people say, okay, I've lived through that. I was just shrinking forever, ever smaller inside myself, inside my sculpture. And on the last day, so the teacher said, I see you as a golfer in Tweed, Tweed, whatever. And so, okay, why not? So I became this persona for five days. And on the sixth day, the last day, the last hour, we had to go on stage, the small stage, and to do a kind of small performance. By then I had cried many times, like because I, each time I fell, but this time, I said, OK, if I'm going to fail, I'm going to be the best, biggest failure in the world. And that's that. So I went on stage. I was scared. I was shy. So that's what I did. I played scared. I didn't play. I just was scared. I was shy, trying to run, to disappear, to, to mix with the wall. And then people laugh. I was just being true to myself. And then people laugh. And they applauded. And I cried because it's like I just discovered something new in myself. So humor was transforming my life, was healing my life. And you're back now? <laughs> 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 yeah, go in front of it now. Yeah, go in front of it. So, I was just telling them that I was the biggest failure in my life, but I played the biggest failure of my life. I didn't hide it, I gave it to the people. And that being honest, being authentic, is what is for me planning about being yourself. So while I was writing my book on how humor heals, I say, I must write to Patch Adams. He must be in my books. You know, for me, Patch Adams is like the Gandhi of laughter, you know, bringing love and peace around the world, laughing. So I wrote to him, and he answered. I got this letter, it's like, Guy, I, I like your project. It's a good idea to write on laughter. 
but I don't have time to meet you. So you must come on a clown mission. And my next one is in Guatemala. I freaked out. What? I'm not a clown. I don't speak Spanish. I'm afraid of flying. How can I do that? That's impossible for me. But you know, when there's a calling, when there's something, it's like, you, I, so I went to see my, my therapist. I talked with her, and then she said, well, okay, Guy, you've given me your arguments, you've for and against. And then she said, okay, now, what do you want? What? Yeah, what do you, I mean, I'm allowed to want something? And then, after a moment, this voice came from inside, and it was clear. I want to go to Guatemala. And that was that. There was, and then it was like tears of freedom to finally listen to my voice coming from inside. So I joined him. So a clown trip, basically you take 20 people from all around the world, you put them in a hotel, and then in the, each day you pack them in a bus, ship them to an orphanage, come back for lunch, afternoon go back to an hospital, and that's basically it. And Guatemala was amazing because we, were in, we had our whole little hostel, hostel for ourselves. So we were like you. I mean, I love you guys. We still don't know much of each other, but I just sense it, you know, being together. And this was new for me. In Amsterdam, I discovered that people can, you know, be friends. And in, how, in, in Guatemala, something new was there. They all wanted to help me. I, I, while I was there helping other people, the, the leader always said, Whatever you do, we are always there for you. Whatever you need, come to see us. We're there for you. So we, we were in a circle, and Patch said, OK, this is your first trip, the first outing. How do you feel? I'm scared. Why? Why are you scared? Well. For me, the unknown always meant danger. Oh, okay. Well, for me, the unknown means a new adventure, a new learning, a new happening, a fun. And just as I say, how can this one same thing have so much two different feelings from it? So we jump on the bus. The others were making noise and all of that. I was kind of joining along. We finally get to the first orphanage, Anini, a center for handicapped young kids. Everyone gets off the bus except me. I mean, who am I to do that? I mean, I'm, I'm no one. I'm not a clown. I, I couldn't. So I stayed in the bus and I just kind of waited. I started to hear the, the laughter of the kids. I look at my nose. And say, I, I came all the way. You know. Then I, I stopped thinking, okay. Took a deep breath, walked down the bus. Just in front of me was a kid in a wheelchair, couldn't really speak with his arm flaying, didn't have motor, motor control. I just look at him, and then when our eyes met, I just gave myself to him. I said, I'm here. And we just started playing. All my fears were went away because I was there for that little boy in the wheelchair. So we played, we blew balloons, 
I came back that night and, and I cried. During the day, I was giving love, but at night, there was no words for it. But I kind of slept two hours each night. I was alone in my room. Because there was something aching inside. Like, I'm here giving love, but it's... I don't know. There was no words. And then we went to a huge orphanage with about uh, 300 kids. And there was this little one, Yorbeli. And Yorbeli, somehow, as soon as I came in, was fascinated by me. I had this bird. So, okay, maybe it was the bird. Didn't matter. As soon as I got in, there was a ceremony, and then she kind of made her way towards me with that smile. I mean, look at that smile. And then she stayed with me. I don't speak Spanish. So she started to rule the other kids. Okay, you sit there, you sit there, you sit there. She started to hand them the balloon. No, don't take the balloon. All in Spanish. This is the sticker, this is the sticker. This is the balloon. Yes, you can. Wow! I don't need to speak Spanish. <laughs> She's just there taking care of me. That was wonderful. That was fun. So we played and we did, you know, uh, I like to do this. You know, you don't need to speak to do that kind of stuff. And then... The dinner bell rang. Bang! It was time to break for lunch. She started to cry because she didn't want to leave. She didn't want to leave me. So she kind of hugged me. So I, I picked her up and I just kind of, you know, tried to do the best to make her feel better until finally an assistant came and then she told her, oh, they're just breaking for lunch. It's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. So I gently, you know, put her down and then little Yorbeli went away. She keeps turning back. And then she, she went inside the building. Once inside, it's like I felt like a ton just fell on me. I couldn't breathe anymore. You know, I thought, this little girl, you know, when this is over, I can go back to Canada, I can go back to my friend. But for her, this is the end of the line. She will remain here alone without a family. And as I thought that, it just felt like a hole was opening on the ground. And I was falling. I was, I was being swallowed. Suddenly a thought came into my mind. It says, well, maybe I can't change your world, but while I'm here, I'm going to give you Everything I have. And as I, <laughs> and as I said that, it's like my, my heart opened. And it's like a light, call it whatever you want. And a light opened, my heart opened, and then the void disappeared. And that's when for me, I became a love clown. That's who I was. I was there to give love. And then she came back the afternoon and we played the whole afternoon and I played with the whole, with the whole kids and we gave love and we hugged. It was just marvelous. And afterwards, I took the bus back with everyone. Finally, back in our home, I talked with one of the other clown friends, Rob. And Rob was a policeman in Seattle, from Seattle. But he was a clown. But he was a policeman. I hated authority. I, 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 you know, I lived in secret in my studio. It just, it was something irritating me. That anybody who's authority, but he was a clown. 
So I, I talked with him and I told him about the experience of, of opening my heart and what had happened. And he said, well, you know, Guy, what you just experienced there is compassion. But this compassion, now that you know of it, you must give to yourself. Compassion? What's that? What's that compassion? No idea. I mean, it's a word. So I, I went to sleep, and that night more memories came back. Memories when I was a Boy Scout, when I was eight years old. And then a group of men. And I wasn't alone. The other boys also were victims and stuff. I just felt I was drowning in blood. I just felt like the sheets were in shards. I was in so much pain. But Rob was there. Rob, the policeman, was part of the group. A crime had been committed. I never had that word in my mouth. A crime had been committed. And for the first time in my life, I used, I could say the R word. I was raped. Before, you know, I was sexually abused, you know, full of flowers and little powder. That's fine. You know, sexually abused, right? that's fine. But raped with the feeling of it. I felt so much pain, and for first time, it's like a crime has been committed against me. And then there was this policeman. You know, what you, if you have a crime, what do you do? You go to the police, and he was there. It's like, but he's a policeman. They're bad. They're the authority. But he's a clown. He's full of love. No, but he's a policeman. But he's a clown! And the whole night was like this. Until the next evening, I made the decision. And I raised my arm during supper. And I said, can I share my story? And for the first time, I just told them, you know, when I was young, and this and this and that. They all cried. We love you, Guy. And it's like, I didn't know this was possible. I didn't know friends existed. I didn't know what the family was. The year after, I went to Peru. And in Peru, the trip was quite different. Because instead of going to hospital and orphanages, we went to the cities where they were living. So they were not sick or anything. They were just doing their best to survive. And it's called Iquitos, and it's by the Amazon River. I still don't speak Spanish, but the, you know, I don't need to speak. You look at these smiles. You don't need to speak Spanish. So we went to their village, which gets inundated all the time. That's why the houses are on tilt, on stilt, and stuff like that. And we just started, you know, running around and playing with them. And then suddenly there was this amazing thunderstorm, like, <laughs> like sheets of rain, a real downpour, crazy. And then the kids kept on laughing, <laughs> while all the clowns were kind of hiding somewhere, trying to find some shelter. And then they did the most amazing thing. You just can picture. They laid down on the floor, in the mud, and they did like this. What did they do? <clears throat> mud angels. Snow angels, mud angels. They were doing mud angels in the pouring rain. Whatever your circumstances are, these kids were just like having love express themselves in their life. And while I was watching that, there was something I noticed that I'd never seen before. All around, they were just like this. Eight-year-olds holding hands with a little six-year-old 
holding hands to four-year-olds, maybe another one having a baby. And they were all so full of love, taking care of each other. And suddenly I felt, this is what we really are. This is what humanity is when it's not civilized. We love each other and we care for each other. And with this new learning, I felt for my first time like roots growing all the way down in the mud. I felt finally I belong to humanity. And this was the first root of forgiveness. And that night, in my journal, I wrote that I could forgive the people who abused me, the people who raped me. It's not their fault. They lost their humanity. The humanity I had just regained. How much they must be suffering like I was suffering. I didn't abuse other people, but I was suffering. And I learned a first lesson in forgiveness. Forgiving my brothers and my sister, forgiving those who were abused. When you focus on your love, on your humanity, there's so much to give. Next trip, I did other trips in between, went back to Guatemala a few times, and then I ended up in India. And then in India, you know, the, you have the, the caste system and the untouchable and stuff like that. Of course, we, all of us know we don't do that kind of stuff, you know. We see other people as humans, not as systems and whatnot. And I started to be more, how could I say, now that I was connected with humanity, not so much more daring, but I started to clown when I was not a clown. I had already lost the nose. I felt I was more like uh, Charlie Chaplin or Buster Keaton or in that tradition of just being a human and not a performer. I was never a clown, I mean, basically. And then there was this, uh, I learned that le leprosy is not, it, it's not contagious. I didn't know that. I said, no, no, it truly it's, they don't, they say they don't know what it is, but it's not, you don't have to fear, you don't catch leprosy. I said, oh, okay. So as I walked in the street, in, in, in a huge staircase, there was this, this lady, uh, having lost a few, you know, fingers and, and toes and bandages, bloody bandages. But so I, I went and I bought her some fruit and some flowers. And I just, you know, sat with her, sang her songs, and touched her. I thought, when was the last time she was touched with love? And prayed. I'm not a denominational religious person. You can pray. Pray to creator, to nature, to whatever. It doesn't matter. You're just being connected to the force, to the you know, to universe. So I and I stayed with her and I sang with her. And then I went to Russia and another trip with Patch. And in Russia, I was even like, being like, not so much. So I was starting to clown by myself, be beside going with the group. But uh, like with you guys, thanks to, to, to Barry and to, to everyone here, when I was said, okay, I'm coming to uh, Ireland, I reached out. Who can I reach out to? Who could be interested in me talking about love? And that's what I, that, the first time I did that was in Russia. That before going, joining the group, I said, I'm going to go and who else can I meet in Russia? I don't need the group anymore. I mean, I do, I'm insecure, but still, you know. So I found the clown association in Moscow, uh, led by him. 
uh, Alexander, and another one in uh, St. Uh, Petersburg. So in the day, I would do the visit with Patch, and in the evening, I would go on outings by myself with these people. And Alexander had one of his job, I mean job, it's not a job, I mean, okay, is going into people's home to give them whatever they need. We started to have fun, we blow balloons, and I, I dance with the father, and they dance with each other, we just, and little kids just go, what's happening here? <laughs> you know, it's just fine, you know, everyone's happy. But at one point, the machine just beep, 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 like urgency. There's something <laughs> happening there. And the parents, like, like that, like, path change. And went to take care of the kid, check the dial, if his passages were clean, and stuff like that. And then my, my heart sank. I said, oh my God, I've, I've just lost everything I've just given them. I, I, I wanted so much to be there for them, but then it, it, the magic is gone. But actually, when we left, they hugged us, and they were so happy. Because we came for the kid, but we came for them. And for that moment, they were having, you know, they were human, they were having fun, they were alive, they were feeling, feeling the spirit. And then that's when I learned the concept of sacrifice. You know? We, us clowns, we're not there for us. And most of you creators, you, you know, you're there because you love the people you are. You are giving to, you're with. And, and that's part of my message. The message of giving. And the more you give, the more there is to give. It, it, it's, it's insane, but it just works like that. So. Uh, Another talk I have is basically all the lessons from everything we've we've talked today, and this is what I, this is the talks I do, the teachings I do, the counseling I do, and I talk about the five dimensions of being, which is the the mind, the heart, the body, the soul, and the universe. The mind, you could say, you. Know, I always say words, words, it's like, I don't know if you know the expression, the map is not the territory, just describe it. There's another expression, if the Buddha points you to the moon, don't look at the finger. Words are the most acceptable solution to describe something that is not des describable. So we're stuck with being imperfect. So. These are the words I propose, but this is not, you know, what I teach is the experience that's behind and not the words. So each of you must find the words that speaks to you. But basically, the mind is basically all your thinking stuff. Imagine uh, a library. It's full of books. All your thoughts. It's the past. Everything about your past is just a library. But the library doesn't do anything. It's just standing there. You know, it's, it's motionless. The heart is the feeling. It's the wind. It's what moves you. And we're moved by feeling. It, it's the energy. The heart is about the future. Uh, we're always thinking of what's best for us. What's best, you know. Uh, the body, well, that's simple. It's the present, you know. Uh, the aim of the body is to survive. We're, and there's so much to say, but we can talk about this later. The soul is, is basically, why are you here? Like, who are you? And the universe call it the creator, the life force, uh, Ganesh, uh, God, doesn't matter. But it's what is beyond you. But the idea when I work with this is that you must forgiveness is about letting go of the past. How do you let go of the past? So I, I think about 
when we breathe, we nourish ourselves. But if you just breathe and don't let go of the shit, what happens? You're a big pack of... Uh... <laughs> yeah, exactly. I won't say it. Thank you. So life is about in and out. Those who do Tai Chi, you kind of have this idea. There's so many science about in and out. So nourishing is you, uh, you can say, you welcome. Whatever happens into your life, you welcome it. You accept it and you value it. Welcome. So, when I look at you, I, I'm in love with, I mean, God, look at you guys. Wow, what a gift I have to be with all of you. I mean, you all have these amazing stories, the amazing life, these amazing feelings that I will never have, and the only way I can have them is if you share them with me. Isn't that it? That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Keeping this R rated. So, no, I'm not R rated. Family rated. Okay. The heart is about being spontaneous, being authentic, and acting with integrity. When I say this word, this is what I practice. The idea is not to attain it. You cannot attain these things. But it's like if you have a North Star, you know in which direction you are going. Just imagine the wonderful, beautiful chaos your life or society would be if everyone was authentic, you know, spontaneous and acting with integrity. Think about relationships. Think about uh, family, think about your job or your work. You say, yeah, but what I've heard most of the time, you say, yeah, but if I really say what I want, well, they won't, you know, my, my wife or partner won't, they don't like it, they won't like me. Or maybe, you know, what's more important, living your own life or living according to your partner's concept of life? You know? Same thing with work, same thing with your job. Your body wants to survive. Well, you know about uh, smoking and food and... You know. We we know what's good for us. Do we do it? Eh. Eh. I see some smiles there. Eh. Anyway. So... It's all about feeding, let forgive, just, ah, we don't need to, just forgive, no expectations. The thing about expectation is that you judge. This is good, this is bad, no judging. This is good, this is, no, just be spontaneous, authentic, uh, let go of control. Whatever happens, happens, it happens. While, you know, some of you know, maybe know this in Chinese, there's the concept of Wu Wei. Somebody, somebody know of this? Wu Wei is when you compare a sailing boat to a motor boat. A sailing boat is whatever the brings, wind bring you, you go with it. You know, you steer your life according to whatever brings you. The motor boat said, damn, I want to go there. You know, you're fighting, and when you're fighting, you get tired, and your your boat body breaks down most of the time. You know? So letting go of control. This is the one we heard the most. It's sad to say, but it's our worthiness. Do you feel you des that you need to deserve to lie to live? Do you live to get validation? No, no you're... Life is a gift. It's a gift. 
you are an amazing gift worthy. There's nothing you need to do. Just the fact that you're here, that's just, wow. That's just amazing. That's just beautiful. It's of the universe. The universe is, we've talked about it, it's the sacrifice. Let, we're stuck in an era of identity, individualism. But I'm sure all of you know what I mean when you say, have you ever been in the zone? Have you ever felt the flow? You know, when you're doing something and you forget to eat, you forget to sleep, you, for, you just forget everything because the experience is so alive, it's so awesome that you just, you know, you're no longer there. And when you're no longer there, time doesn't exist. It's timeless. It's a timeless feeling. All of these things is inside. I, I think we'll talk more about this later if you want this or other thing. But yesterday uh, I was talking to a friend who was feeling sad about his, his relationship and uh, letting go. Like for me, letting go, it's true. But letting go of what? That, that's the hard part. And I, I gave them uh, an example. I don't know if I can still... Uh, if you're in a noisy room, okay. and one by one you start to take away you know, the people who make noise, and the machine who makes noise, and the fan who makes noise, and you know, eventually you get silence. No. The kind of Zen philosophical question is that did taking away these things created the silence or was the silence always there under all that noise? He felt that he needed love and he was sad because the person he loved was gone and stuff like that. And I told him, well, the love that you felt, did it come from the other person? Or was the other person, the love you have is always there inside of you. The people you meet, the occasions, they're just mirrors of what you have inside. And the more you get in touch with that love, which is not you, you know, that's why I said the last one, you're not there. You know? Get out of your own way. And this is how I live, and this is how I see all of you today. I mean, life is an amazing gift worthy of, of the love that is there. So each moment, and I'm not saying that to talk about me, but I'm nothing special. My life is not important. Actually, I just said it, my life is not important because the love inside you, like the silence, is always there. As long as you're busy with the past, which you don't forgive, it's busy in your room. As long as you're busy with the future, it's busy in the room. As long as you're busy trying to control everything there, you can't fill the room. As long as you feel that you need the approval of people, the validation of people, it's noise in the room. That's just my, my star. That's just, you know, that's just what I discovered. So maybe the book is about me. But actually, I don't know. People say, gee, stop saying that. But it's like, I don't give a shit about myself. I'm in the way. I'm alive. It's fun. I have pain. I have problems. But that's just superficial stuff. And that's what humor, and that's what 
clowning brought to me. It brought to me, he, your shit. <laughs> You're so funny. You're so full of it. I am full of it. What? It, it, the mind. I'm full of expectation. I'm full of concept, of ideas. But when <coughs> let that go, the love comes. It's like a, a, a source that just fills, it fills from the inside. So while you think that if you give, then you must exchange because you're not going to get enough. Well, you just keep filling the room with the wrong stuff. My experience, I got into an argument the other day about this. It's like, I don't believe in anything. You know, in, in the other Ireland, they, they, two, three people ask me about faith and Christianity. I say, okay, why not, if you want to use that word. But eventually what I said is, I don't believe. But I don't believe, not in God, I just don't believe in anything. I only speak what I experience. That's it. If I experience it, then I will share it. What I believe, you please don't give a shit. That's irrelevant. But what I experience, it, what I experience is that love is from inside, and it's limitless. All you need to do is you know, observe, accept, value, be spontaneous, be authentic. Take yourself out of the equation, and you're just going to fill up. It's just, just amazing. So, thank you. Uh, I love you all. There you go. <laughs>